Bueno, soy Luis Alcalá, director del Parque de las Ciencias. Estoy muy contento de dar la bienvenida a quienes estáis aquí, de saludar a quienes estáis conectados, conectadas y presentar a mi gran amigo y insigne paleontólogo Mark. Welcome, Mark, to Granada, to Parque de las Ciencias, Spain. Hemos compartido algunas aventuras tanto en España como en Estados Unidos y ahora está a vuestra disposición gracias a la mediación de Isabel de nuestro Departamento de Educación para satisfacer aquellas curiosidades o preguntarle cualquier cosa que os atraiga del mundo de los dinosaurios. Es un experto mundial en distintos tipos de dinosaurios, tiranosaurios, ceratopsios y también otros y es una ocasión única de conocer a un investigador de vanguardia y a una persona muy próxima, muy cercana. Podéis dirigiros a él con toda familiaridad y él está encantado de atender a vuestras cuestiones. Venga, al lío. Gracias, Luis. Bueno, buenos días, bienvenidos a todos, a los que estáis aquí y también a los que estáis conectados desde vuestro centro. Soy 28 centros de toda Andalucía, un total de 1.413 escolares. Daros las gracias por vuestras preguntas, las preguntas que nos habéis hecho llegar. Vamos a trasladarlas a Marc. Y, bueno, y los grupos que estáis aquí, pues ahora, después, cuando vayamos terminando, avanzando, eh, también tendréis la ocasión de hacer alguna pregunta. Pues, Marc, good morning, good afternoon, perhaps. Uh, welcome to the Parque de las Ciencias. It's very nice to be with you here. We are going to ask you questions that uh, students have sent to us. But the first one, uh, to allow you to speak a little about you, because we want to know, um, is, is that possible a dinosaur changes your life? Certainly. I love dinosaurs, right? Every paleontologist is asked, why did you want to become a paleontologist? For me, I wanted to be a dinosaur, but it turned out I could not be a dinosaur. So the second best thing was actually starting to study dinosaurs. So I got fortunate enough that I started studying one of the most famous dinosaurs, Allosaurus, and that led to studying T-Rex and it led to studying Triceratops. So one dinosaur, Allosaurus, changed my life and gave me many different dinosaurs to pursue um, as I do my research. It is going perhaps uh, happen today with someone of students yes. that are here. I, I know several <laughs> paleontologists from Spain There are many, many amazing fossils from Spain. So maybe one of you, either watching from afar or in this room, can someday become a paleontologist. Um, about uh, paleontology, why do you think dinosaur fossils are so magnetic, as you say? The reason why dinosaurs are so amazing is because they had sharp teeth, You know, imagine an animal with teeth like this and claws like this. You know, they're extinct, but they're not. They live together with us today as the many, many species of birds. There are more species of dinosaurs alive today than there are of mammals. So dinosaurs are amazing because their fossils show us these huge animals that lived before but we still have the dinosaurs alongside us today as birds. Mm -hmm. What other things could have had uh, dinosaurs that perhaps uh, we can uh, think uh, uh, would it be possible? So dinosaurs are amazing creatures. <coughs> we learn about their behavior by looking at modern animals like alligators and birds. Dinosaurs can tell us stories about how the world changes and how life adapts to those changes that happened. Dinosaurs were very, very successful, lived for a long time on a very changing planet. So watching how dinosaurs react to climate change, to changes in their environment, to geographic changes, 
we can actually learn lessons today about how our world is changing, both through our actions and just natural actions as the world changes. Mm -hmm. uh, we received uh, a question, a question uh, which uh, has, uh, students were very interested on, in it. It's uh, related to DNA. Mm, would, uh, it would be possible to recreate a dinosaur starting uh, with some d DNA we have found in, uh, somewhere from a dinosaur? The problem with getting DNA from dinosaur bones is that DNA has a half-life of right around 5,000 years. So DNA really deteriorates to the point where I don't think we're ever going to see a situation in which we actually get DNA from dinosaur bones. But we do have dinosaur DNA all around us in birds. They still have the DNA in their bodies that can tell them make teeth, make a tail. So at least two different labs in the United States have been working on the dino chicken type project where they're trying to reverse engineer birds to actually have the traits that are more like dinosaurs, like having tails, like having teeth, separate bones in their, in their shins, things like that. Um, so while I don't think we're going to clone a dinosaur based on DNA that we get from fossils, we can maybe get a dino chicken that kind of looks like a dinosaur. It's something, somehow, the story we saw in Jurassic Park. Yes. Something like and that. I think it's much more likely that we see a cloned mammoth, mm -hmm. which only lived 5,000 years ago, or maybe an aurochs, or an early horse, than we are going to see a dinosaur. Okay. But would you not pay to go see a red-headed mammoth? At, at Jurassic Zoo, mm -hmm. it would be amazing. Yes. Uh, speaking about colors, uh, could we know which colors uh, were in uh, feathers, for example, that dinosaur uh, could have had? So there's been a revolution in color in dinosaurs. If you would have asked us 10, 15 years ago if we would ever know what color dinosaurs were, we would say no. But some brilliant scientists actually started looking at feathers and looking at the tiny little crystals on each filament of a feather and looking at modern feathers and recognizing that each color in a feather is actually represented by a different shaped crystal of a melanosome. And by looking at that, they were able to then go back and look at fossil feathers. And we can tell you what color some feathered dinosaurs were. We've only since 1996 actually understood that dinosaurs actually had feathers. So really just recently in the history of paleontology have we learned that dinosaurs had feathers, dinosaurs for sure gave rise to birds, but now we're able to tell you what color certain dinosaurs were. We can tell you that Archaeopteryx looked like a raven, which is kind of boring because it's just a big black bird. But we have some dinosaurs from China like Microraptor that was iridescent, blue, purple, green, all shimmering in the sun. So by looking at modern feathers that have certain shapes that are iridescent, we can identify that that animal is completely covered with it. Some other dinosaurs that had feathers are things like Anchiornis. So it was black and white and gray with a bright red crest of feathers along the top of its head. So every day we're learning more and more. Some people are actually starting to look at dinosaur skin. And I'm hopeful that maybe in the next five to 10 years, we'll actually learn what some of the leather of dinosaur skin, you know, here's a cast of some dinosaur skin, but what color was that leather? We don't know yet. But people are starting to look at the residues of some skin, and maybe we'll be able to tell. Who knows? Maybe one of you in this room will solve that problem. I don't know.
It's perhaps the same with ice, color ice, the color of the ice. It's tough. So when we think about eyes, one of the cool things is the eyes of some dinosaurs had bones inside the eyes. We call them sclerotic rings, and it's literally bones inside the eyeball that help it focus. Things like owls and hawks have these today. Dinosaurs had the same thing. So when we want to know what color the actual eyeball of a dinosaur was, we have to look at modern animals. And if we look at modern animals, we're going to look at the descendants of dinosaurs, which are birds, or we're going to look at alligators and things like that. So looking at that, some of the possible colors for some dinosaur eyes are yellow, orange, blue, brown, we don't know. Which, which other animal, actual uh, animal do you uh, use to understand dinosaurs? Animals, I mean, uh, which are living now. Yeah, so if we want to study an ancient organism and understand it with things that aren't preserved, things like eyeballs or things like that, we need to look at an ancestor and a descendant. The dinosaurs' closest relatives that are alive today are the crocodiles and alligators, and then the birds. So we look at crocodiles, alligators, birds, caimans, things like that. And uh, a very interesting question was, uh, how do you know when you find something in the country, in the land, that uh, you have a fossil? Because in a museum, it's easy to, to know that something is a fossil. We have some of them here. But in the, in the land, it must be very difficult, no? Yeah, so very seldom do we find an entire skull like this. This is a skull of a dinosaur, a fierce dinosaur that's famous from the movie Jurassic Park. Anybody have any ideas? What's one of the fierce dinosaurs from Jurassic Park? There? Over there? A yes, this is Velociraptor. Now, it's not this long like it is in Jurassic Park. This is the actual size of Velociraptor. So I think if you had a good pair of boots and maybe a stick, you shouldn't be afraid of Velociraptor. Um, this is the size of Velociraptor's claw from Jurassic Park. This is the actual claw. You know, Velociraptor is wimpy. But the same year that Jurassic Park came out, we actually found Utah Raptor in Utah. And that is an animal that is closer to the size of Velociraptor. So there were raptor dinosaurs out there that are the size of the raptors in Jurassic Park. But again, getting back to the question, it's not very common that we find an entire skull like this. Usually we find just a fragment of bone. And one of the things that paleontologists actually do is they will take that piece of something they think is a bone and lick it. And if it sticks to your tongue, it's probably very porous, which is from all the vesicles inside the original bone. And so dinosaur bone will stick to your tongue in the way that rocks won't. Um, at the same time, very few paleontologists actually walk around picking up rocks and putting their tongue on them. Um, the real answer is you see enough fossils and you know what a fossil is just by having seen enough of them. Okay, okay. Um, spoken about Jurassic Park, uh, did you collaborate with some uh, movie maker? So many paleontologists have actually advised on some of the films for Jurassic Park. I actually worked some on Walking with Dinosaurs 2, um, a film that we actually like to call Talking with Dinosaurs because all the dinosaurs talk in that film. Um, in the upcoming Jurassic Park or Jurassic World uh, Dominion, uh, there will be some dinosaurs uh, that I've worked on, including Nasutoceratops and Allosaurus in that. So. 
did you like this experience of working it's with... It's a lot of fun. Yes? It's a lot of fun. Okay. Okay. And uh, then we have your name at the end of the film uh, as a collaborator. Maybe. <laughs> um, uh, in fi uh, on uh, movies, we see that uh, dinosaurs are very, very um, scary. Scary. Uh, were they really like that? Yes. Um, if you met T Rex in a dark alley, you should run as fast as you can. <laughs> Some of you might be faster than T Rex. It's probably true that T-Rex only could go about 17 miles an hour, sometimes somewhere between 17 and 25 miles an hour, not the 35 miles an hour that you see in the film. But T-Rex is an animal that would grab a person with its head and rip a person apart. So really, T-Rex eats by tearing chunks of animals apart and swallowing them whole. Mm -hmm. We have the poop from T-Rex. We call them coprolites. What do you think it's full of? Fragments of bone. Mm. So T-Rex would literally swallow chunks of animals, bone, muscle, skin, everything. That would go into its stomach and it would rot in its stomach and then you just get poop that's full of bone fragments. <laughs> was uh, was T-Rex the most Dangerous dinosaur? I think the most dangerous dinosaur is the one that you meet when you get out of the time machine. <laughs> At the same time, um, yes, I don't think any dinosaur could have beat T-Rex um, if it was in a fight with T-Rex, except for other T-Rex. A paper just came out today claiming that a T-Rex named Peter was killed and partially eaten by another T-Rex. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what beats T-Rex in a fight? Mm -hmm. T-Rex. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, was it uh, uh, hunters or scavengers? Both? So, uh, there's been a story about whether T-Rex was a scavenger for a long time. And one of the reasons for that is this is a velociraptor, but the brain of velociraptor is about the size of an M&M. &M. Just right here, back in this part of the skull. It's a tiny, tiny brain. The brain of T-Rex is, you know, T-Rex is almost six feet long, its skull. But its brain is literally about as big as this skull. So it's a tiny brain. Tiny, tiny, tiny brain. It's not even as smart as a bird. But it has a rather enlarged area where the olfactory lobes are that are related to the sense of smell. So it seems that T-Rex had a very well-developed sense of smell. So paleontologists started saying that T-Rex is going to wander around following its nose and looking for a rotten carcass for it to eat. At the same time, T-Rex is the top predator in its ecosystem. So while no predator is going to pass up a free lunch of a rotting triceratops laying over there by a tree, it's still going to be able to kill triceratops at the same time. And we have direct evidence that T-Rex bit triceratops and triceratops got away and those wounds healed. We literally have the back of triceratops with a piece of T-Rex's tooth in the bones, but then it's rehealed and Triceratops survived it. So we know that at least sometimes T-Rex would attack living animals and they would get away. So almost certainly T-Rex would scavenge any time it got a, a chance, mm -hmm. but it also was an active predator. Okay, and uh, why uh, did it have uh, so little front legs? Yeah, so the arms of T-Rex, they're, they're useless, right? You know, it's got two little fingers, you know, can't even really pick its teeth. <laughs> A paper just came out this month that actually talks about that, and they said since dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex and Carnotaurus and some of Bellosaurus, some of these dinosaurs have ridiculously stumpy little arms. 
But the way that we know that they hunt is they're headhunters. They go around, they grab something with their head, literally rip it apart and swallow it. So the argument is they have ridiculously small arms because they're not using their arms to hunt. And by making your arms small, you're not going to injure them. So having these tiny little vestigial arms keeps the arms from getting hurt as it's grappling with something, you know, shaking it apart like a dog will with a rat. That's the idea. Okay. Uh, I think you have a... You, I don't know if you, you have a dinosaur you, that you prefer. So every paleontologist is always asked, what is your favorite dinosaur? <laughs> right. For me, it's two rather obscure dinosaurs. My favorite meat-eating dinosaur is a dinosaur called Ceratosaurus. And it's got horns. Even though it's a meat-eating dinosaur, it has horns above its eyes and a horn on top of its nose. And then it has huge, long steak knife teeth. For me, I think that's the coolest meat-eating dinosaur. And then my favorite plant-eating dinosaur is a dinosaur called Styracosaurus, and it's got big, huge horns coming off of its entire head. So those are mine. Most people say T-Rex, which is a good answer. Um, uh, students were interested in knowing if uh, there, there were uh, fossils here in Granada, in the area, or even in Spain, the peninsula. So there aren't dinosaur fossils right here in Granada, but definitely Spain has an amazing record of dinosaur fossils. Um, I've actually been fortunate enough to work on naming some of these dinosaurs, dinosaurs like Europelta is a really cool dinosaur from Spain that I got to work on. Um, you have armored dinosaurs, you have meat-eating dinosaurs, you have plant-eating dinosaurs, you have the long-necked dinosaurs, you had all of the cool dinosaurs living here in Spain. And uh, where were the place where the first dinosaur was found? It's really tough. So the first dinosaur ever found was found by some hominid who was walking along and saw these giant bones. Did they recognize it for what it was? I don't know. But, you know, we've had myths about dragons for thousands and thousands of years. So who found the first dinosaur? I have no idea. But, you know, it was some kind of hominid, and they recognized that as a really big animal that wasn't alive today, or maybe it is alive, and we just haven't seen it yet. In science, the first dinosaur ever recognized in Western science was a meat-eating dinosaur in England called Megalosaurus. And it was named um, in 1824. So since then, we've had, you know, well over a thousand dinosaurs have been named since then. When you find uh, a, dinos a dinosaur, uh, do you find often uh, the complete skeleton of it? It's very seldom that we find the complete skeleton. Mm -hmm. So usually we find just a bone or just a piece of bone. Mm -hmm. Of course, we want to find a complete skeleton. Um, because often when you have a complete skeleton, you'll get things like skin. Um, you know, we, um, I, I work in Utah, and in southern Utah, we have some amazing national parks. And between them, there are rocks that we go to dig up dinosaur fossils. So we get lots and lots of duck-billed dinosaurs. Half of the duck-billed dinosaurs that we find are piles of bones that belong to a single skeleton. And any time we get a pile of bones that belongs to a single skeleton, half of them have skin preserved along with them. So it's amazing what you can find if, you're actually, if you actually know what you're looking for. You know, we have, we have some dinosaurs. We're learning more and more about skin. We're learning about what the face looked like. We're learning maybe about eyelids, lips on dinosaurs, things like that. That's some of the cutting edge things that are. And what about the eggs, the nest? You find sometimes the embryos inside the eggs. How do you know which is the, the father, the mother? 
the parents? So <laughs> we have found one dinosaur that we know is a mother dinosaur because it still has two eggs in the egg canal. So that one for sure is a female dinosaur. It turns out that all dinosaurs laid two eggs at a time. So modern birds only lay one egg at a time, but they've gotten rid of half of their reproductive system in order to lighten the load and be able to fly. Dinosaurs, it appears, laid two eggs at a time. We're learning lots about dinosaur eggs. Um, if you think about eggs in animals, snakes have eggs, crocodiles have eggs. What color are those eggs? Anybody know? Reptile eggs, crocodile eggs? Even Just guess. Blanco. Blanco. Right? So we thought that colored eggs only belong to birds. But then some brilliant scientist from Yale started actually looking at eggshells, and the same pigments that are in modern bird eggshells are preserved in some meat eating dinosaur eggshells. So we know that colored eggs, speckled, blue, things like this, show up first in meat eating dinosaurs. And these color patterns in eggs are actually something that we associate with parenting and nesting behavior. So in the beginning, dinosaurs started off by laying their eggs and burying the eggs in a nest, kind of like a crocodile does. In fact, many dinosaurs have soft shell eggs. We know that at least the ancestors to the long necked dinosaurs had soft eggs, like a turtle egg or a crocodile egg. We know that ceratopsians also did. But within the meat-eating dinosaurs, they got hard eggs, elongated eggs, like this egg that's sitting right here, but it would have been speckled and brilliant and blue. So, yeah, I mean, if you would have asked me 10 years ago if we'd ever know what color dinosaur eggs were, we would have said white. Mm -hmm. But instead, now we know that they're mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. And we have time for one question for both groups. Do you want to start there? Okay. So please. Uh, hello. Uh, cool dinosaur communicate to others or with sound they emit. So again, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if cool dinosaurs communicate with other dinosaurs. Could dinosaurs communicate with other dinosaurs? Certainly, almost certainly. Um, when we think about the ways that things like crocodiles and alligators, they actually will communicate with really low sounds or with chirps. So if crocodiles can do it, and we know that birds communicate with each other in their amazing vocalizations, same thing is going on with dinosaurs. In fact, some of the bigger dinosaurs almost certainly communicated with infrasound like sounds that you wouldn't be able to hear because they're so low. But we know that things like elephants can communicate over like 15 to 20 miles with infrasound. And those kinds of sounds are really, really possible in things like the long neck dinosaurs and the big giant ones. Uh, why it can be interesting to discover the color of the dinosaur? It's amazing. Like, if we know what color a dinosaur is, uh, it makes all the artists who like to make up what color a dinosaur is going to be. But at the same time, um, you know, if we really know what color they are, it's amazing. We have another question. Over there, I think. What's your favorite dinosaur? Do you have a one that you prefer? T-Rex, that's a good answer. Okay, so hello. Um, my question is, uh, did they look after of the descendants? Yes, so did they take care of their young? So this is another thing about eggs that have color. So we associate the colored eggs 
in, in one way, it keeps somebody else from laying their egg in your nest because you know that all your eggs are blue. And maybe if you get a speckled egg in there, maybe you don't want to take care of that one, so you kick it out. We actually know that this behavior goes on. We have some feathered dinosaurs from Mongolia that laid eggs and sat on top of the nest with their wings, taking care of the eggs. And probably for like two or three months. So it turns out dinosaurs had really long gestation periods for hatching their eggs. But we have one of these nests full of these little oviraptors, and there's one velociraptor egg in that nest. So that was a velociraptor comes in and lays her egg in the friendly non-toothed dinosaur's nest. So yes, parental care definitely happens with some dinosaurs. We even have some duck-billed dinosaurs that took care of their young. Well, I am very sorry we have to finish. It has been very, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much for your expertise, your storytelling. It has been nice and honor for me to be here speaking with you. And uh, we will see you this afternoon at 18 in your conference, Rise of the Tyrant Dinosaurs, and tomorrow in the launch of the new planetarium, Dinosaurs, a Story of Survival in, uh, in the Parque de las Ciencias. Thank you. Thank My you very pleasure. much.